Lesson 7 of The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. 7. Functions of Relation, Nervous System and Sensibility. Functions of Relation. The phenomena of animal life or life of relation depend upon two faculties that of sensation and that of motion. These faculties, which do not exist in an equal degree of perfection in all animals, are wanting in vegetables. They are the result of an action of two apparatuses, the apparatus of sensations and the apparatus of motion. The apparatus of sensations is composed of the nervous system and the organs of the senses. The apparatus of motion is composed of the muscles, of the bones, and of some other organs. Apparatus of the sensations. Sensibility is the faculty of receiving impressions from surrounding objects. This faculty has its seat in a particular apparatus called the nervous system. It is also through the medium of this nervous system that motion takes place, that the influence of the will makes itself felt in different parts of the body, and that the phenomena of intelligence is manifested. We distinguish in this apparatus two principal parts, which are called the nervous system of animal life and the nervous system of organic life. The nervous system of animal life presides over the functions of the life of relation. It is also called the cerebrospinal system because the brain and spinal marrow are the most important parts of it. The term encephalon is applied to the great nervous mass formed by these two organs, and the other central parts of the nervous system lodged in the cavity of the cranium and in the canal which exists in the whole length of the vertebral column. The cranium is a great cavity which occupies all the superior and posterior parts of the head, and which, at the inferior part or base presents several holes. One of these holes, which is very much larger than the other and placed a little behind, gives it a communication with the vertebral canal. The vertebral canal is a cavity hollowed out in the vertebral column or spine, of which it occupies the whole length. It consequently descends from the head all along the back to the lowest extremity of the trunk and even into the tail when the animal is provided with an appendix of this sort. When we study the skeleton, we shall recur to the description of these parts. The brain or cerebrum is a voluminous viscous of a very soft texture and of an oval form which fills the greatest part of the anterior of the cranium. It is divided on a middle line by a very deep furrow into two halves called hemispheres of the brain. Each of these hemispheres is subdivided in its turn into three lobes and presents on its surface a great number of hollows and projections folded on themselves called the convolutions of the brain. We find in the interior cavities called ventricles, and we distinguish in the substance of which it is composed two sorts of matter, one white, called medullary, 
which occupies the interior of the mass of the brain, and the other, of a grayish color, forms its superficies and is called cortical. Behind and below the cerebrum, or brain, we find, also in the cavity of the cranium, another nervous mass, very much smaller, but of analogous structure, which is called the cerebellum. The spinal marrow arises from the inferior part of the brain and cerebellum. It has the form of a thick whitish cord and descends from the interior of the cranium to the lowest part of the canal which pierces the vertebral column. We give the name of medulla oblongata to the superior portion of the spinal marrow which is enclosed in the cranium. The encephalon, which includes the brain and spinal marrow, also called the cerebrospinal axis, is surrounded by different membranes which serve to prevent it from wounding itself against the sides of the bony case which encloses it. One of these membranes, called the arachnoid, is extremely fine. Another, called the dura mater, is on the contrary very strong and in the interior of the cranium forms plates or folds which descend between the hemispheres of the cerebrum and between this organ and the cerebellum to sustain these parts and prevent them from pressing one upon the other. A great number of soft whitish cords go from the brain and spinal marrow to all parts of the body. They are designated by the name of nerves. These nerves arise, some from the base of the brain, others from the sides of the spinal marrow. In man there are 43 pairs, of which the first 13 arise from the brain and medulla oblongata and pass out of the cranium through holes in its base, and the remaining 30 pairs arise from the spinal marrow and go out of the vertebral canal by holes situate on each side of the spine. The nerves are divided into branches and ramuscules, which are spread out in the different organs and in them become so extremely fine as to escape our vision. They possess extreme sensibility and the slightest wound of one of them causes acute pain. The nerves give to different parts of the body to which they are distributed the sensibility which these parts enjoy. They convey the impressions received by the organs to the brain, which is the seat of the perception of senses. It is also through the medium of the nerves that the influence of the will is communicated from the brain to different parts of the body, and that motion is performed. Indeed, if we cut the nerves which go to a limb, it becomes immediately insensible and ceases to execute voluntary motion, or in other words, it is paralyzed. Certain nerves serve only for the transmission of sensations, others serve only for motion, but the greater part fulfill both these functions at the same time. This arises from the union of a certain number of nervous fibers, of which some possess the first of these faculties, and others the second. At the point where the nerves issue from the spinal marrow, these two species of fibers are still separate, and constitute two distinct roots, one situated before the other. The anterior root serves for motion and the posterior for sensibility. When in a living animal we cut the anterior roots of all these nerves, it is incapable of moving, but preserves its sensibility. While if we cut the posterior roots without wounding the anterior, 
the contrary is true the ganglionic nervous system also called the great sympathetic nerve or nervous system of organic life is composed of a number of small very distinct nervous masses which are united to each other by medullary cords and different nerves which anastomose communicate by branches with the cerebrospinal system or are distributed to the neighboring organs these nervous centers bear the name of ganglions they are found in the head neck thorax and abdomen most of them are placed symmetrically on each side of a middle line in front of the vertebral column and thus form a double chain from the head to the pelvis but they are found in other parts near the heart for example and in the vicinity of the stomach that sensations may be perceived it is necessary that the nerves transmit them from the point where they are produced to the brain either directly or through the intervention of the spinal marrow the brain is at the same time the seat of the will and of the perception of sensations when in consequence of a wound or strong compression this organ cannot perform its functions the animal becomes insensible ceases to execute voluntary motions and falls into a state resembling profound sleep it is remarkable that the nerves which arise from the right side of the spinal marrow communicate with the left hemisphere of the cerebrum and vice versa this results from the crossing of the fibers in the medulla oblongata and hence it is that when the brain is paralyzed on one side only it is the members of the opposite side of the body which lose their sensibility in motion farther the brain although the seat of perception of sensations is itself very slightly sensible we may prick or cut it in a living animal without causing pain the spinal marrow is on the contrary extremely sensible and when it is wounded the animal is convulsed if it can be cut or compressed so that it cannot perform its functions all the parts of the body whose nerves arise below the point of injury are at once paralyzed the cerebellum seems to be designed to regulate motion the second portion of the nervous system or nervous system of organic life communicates with the nerves which arise from the spinal marrow by a great number of small filaments but it is distinct from it this apparatus which is also designated under the name of ganglionic system or great sympathetic on account of the connection which it establishes between different parts of the body is composed of a great number of small nervous masses called ganglions situated in the neck in the thorax and in the abdomen in front of the vertebral column and tied to each other by communicating cords a multitude of nerves arise from these ganglions and are spread out in the heart the lungs the intestines the glands and other organs of vegetative life these parts of the body which receive their nerves from the ganglionic system are slightly sensible and the movements which they execute are independent of the will the principal nerves of sensibility terminate in particular organs through the medium of which they receive and transmit to the brain the sensations produced upon us by surrounding objects these organs are each destined to receive sensations of a certain kind and are called organs of the senses. End of lesson seven.
Lesson 8 of The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January 2018. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 8 Functions of Relation sense of touch skin hands hair beard nails horns mode of formation sense of smell olfactory apparatus sense of taste sense of hearing auditory apparatus we give the name of senses to those faculties by the aid of which animals take cognizance of the properties of bodies which surround them. Bodies may differ from each other in different ways, in their weight, their hardness, their volume, their temperature, etc., by their odor, their taste, their form and their color, or by the sounds which they afford. These various qualities cannot be appreciated by the same organ. The organ which perceives taste, for example, is not sensible of the color or odor of bodies. Therefore, the faculty of experiencing sensations from the influence derived from each other of these different kinds of the properties of external objects is the attribute of a particular organ. These faculties or senses in men and most animals are five in number, namely touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight. Touch and taste are only exercised upon bodies which are brought into contact with those organs which are the seat of those senses. Smell, hearing, and sight make us acquainted with certain properties of objects at a greater or less distance from us. All animals do not possess the senses in an equal number with man. In some, there is neither organ of sight, nor organ of hearing, nor organ of smell, such is the oyster, for example. In others, one or another of these instruments is wanting. We will now consider each one of the senses and the organs which are the seat of them. On the sense of touch touch is the sense which reveals to us the contact of foreign bodies with our organs and informs us of the nature of their surfaces whether rough or smooth their movements the degree of their consistence their temperature and to a certain extent their form volume and weight tact is a passive touch but this function sometimes becomes active it is more especially called touch when the sensibility is most exquisite and the surface which is its seat can in a manner mould itself to objects tactile sensibility is spread out in all parts of the surface of the body and resides in the skin the skin is the membrane which covers or clothes the body it is principally composed of two parts one called the corium or derma or true skin the other the epidermis or cuticle or scarf skin the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin it is a sort of thick varnish which covers the derma and serves to protect it against the contact of hard bodies and prevent it from becoming dry by the action of the air the derma is the thickest and most important part of the skin it is beneath the epidermis and adheres to the subjacent parts by its internal face. A considerable number of nerves are distributed in it and form upon its surface small elevations called papillae. To these nerves the skin owes its sensibility, which is greatest in those parts where there is the greatest number of papillae, as in the ends of the fingers, for example. The epidermis is applied upon these nervous papillae, it is not itself endowed with sensibility and renders the sense of touch less delicate in proportion to its thickness frequent contact with rough and hard substances tends to increase its thickness 
thus the hands of those persons who perform laborious work have the epidermis thicker and less sensible than those whose occupation does not place them in the same circumstances hair beard nails horns etc are productions formed by small secreting organs lodged in the substance of the skin they are developed like the teeth by the addition of new portions of their substance upon that already formed and are not like living organs the seat of a nutritive movement we give the name of bulb to the secreting organs of the hair and beard finally there exists in the thickness of the derma little follicles which secrete the sweat a liquid which is more or less acid the contact of an object with any point of the surface of the skin is sufficient to determine a sensation there but that touch may be exercised it is necessary that the part where this contact takes place shall be so formed as to apply itself exactly and in a manner mould itself to the object which the animal wishes to feel this kind of perfected tact has its seat in particular organs called organs of touch in man the hand is the special organ of touch and its structure is admirably well adapted to the exercise of this sense the fineness of the skin its great sensibility the species of cushion formed by the subcutaneous fat at the extremities of the fingers the length and flexibility of these organs and the capability of opposing the thumb to the other fingers like a pair of pliers or forceps are so many conditions essentially favourable to the delicacy of this sense and enables us to appreciate with great exactitude the qualities of those bodies we may feel most animals have very imperfect instruments of touch and in general the greater part of the surface of their bodies is slightly or not at all sensible on account of the hairs feathers scales and other hard parts with which their skins are covered of the sense of taste taste is a sense which makes us acquainted with the savour or taste of substances like touch taste is exercised by contact only its seat is in the mouth the parts of the mouth where this peculiar kind of sensibility resides are the edges of the tongue and the arch of the palate all substances are not sapid those which are not soluble in water seldom are in order to act upon the sense of taste it is necessary that the sapid substances which the animal introduces into its mouth should be dissolved by the fluids poured into this cavity by the salivary glands or by some other liquid it is in a state of solution that savours are perceived by the nerves of taste which are spread out upon the surface of the tongue and which transmit to the brain the impressions of this sense of the sense of smell the sense of smell reveals to us the existence of odours and enables us to appreciate them odours are produced by extremely fine particles which escape from odorous substances and which are diffused in the air like a vapour that odours may act upon the sense of smell the odoriferous particles must come in contact with the surface of the organ wherein this sense is seated the sense of smell is exercised in a peculiar apparatus called the nasal fossae the nasal fossae figure twenty seven are two large cavities in the face which communicate externally by the openings of the nose or nostrils and open behind into the pharynx by the posterior nares or nostrils the walls of these cavities form in front a more or less prominent ridge which constitutes the nose and a vertical partition separates one from the other finally they are lined by a soft and very delicate membrane called the pituitary membrane the first pair of cerebral nerves which are called the olfactory nerves are distributed to this membrane and transmit to the brain the impressions produced by the contact of odoriferous particles 
the air which traverses the nasal fossae in order to reach the lungs carries with it the odorous particles of substances and it is by touching the pituitary membrane that these particles produce the sensations of smells the form of the nasal fossae is such that the air is carried towards their superior parts where the greatest number of the delicate filaments of the olfactory nerve is distributed it is vulgarly believed that the humours with which the pituitary membrane is lubricated come from the brain but this is an error they are secreted by this membrane itself and the slight diseases known under the name of cold in the head room of the head are nothing else than inflammation of this membrane of the sense of hearing hearing is the sense which enables us to perceive sounds sounds are produced by very rapid oscillatory movements which are manifested in sonorous bodies and which are called vibrations sonorous vibrations are communicated from the bodies in which they are produced to the surrounding air and are thus propagated little by little or nearer and nearer like the undulation produced on the surface of smooth water by casting a stone into it that sounds may act upon our senses the oscillatory motion must reach the bottom of the apparatus of hearing that it may agitate the extremity of the nerve destined to transmit the sensation which it produces the apparatus of hearing is called the ear it is double and is symmetrically placed on each side of the head each of these apparatuses is lodged in the interior of one of the bones of the cranium called the temporal bone that part of the temporal bone which contains it is extremely hard and for this reason has received the name of petrous bone the apparatus of hearing is very complicated in its structure it may be divided into three principal parts which anatomists have called the external ear the middle ear or cavity of the tympanum and the internal ear or labyrinth figure twenty eight the external ear is composed of the pavilion of the ear and the auditory canal meatus auditorius externus the external ear or pavilion of the ear figure twenty eight p is a very elastic cartilaginous plate which surrounds the entrance to the auditory apparatus and presents in many animals the form of a trumpet which serves to direct sounds towards the interior of the ear in man the pavilion of the ear presents many ridges and furrows or anfractuosities arising from the folds of the cartilaginous plate which forms it the auricular canal or external auditory canal meatus auditorius externus figure twenty eight c a is a species of tube which commences at the bottom of a widened part of the pavilion called concha and buries itself in the temporal bone it is gaping at its external extremity but ends internally in a species of membranous partition named membrana tympani drum of the ear which separates it from the middle ear the middle ear is composed of the cavity of the tympanum and some small accessory parts the name of tympanum figure twenty eight c a i is given to a small cavity of irregular form which is hollowed out in the petrous portion of the temporal bone and which is found to lie between the auditory canal and the internal ear it is filled with air which gets there through a canal called the eustachian tube which opens in the superior part of the pharynx the entrance to the tympanum is closed by a very thin partition which is stretched like a parchment over a drum and hence the name tympanum this membrane serves to facilitate the transmission of sounds from without to the very bottom of the auditory apparatus and also to moderate the intensity of sounds for it is so arranged that it can be stretched or relaxed and when stretched it transmits sounds less perfectly 
we also remark in the interior of the tympanum a transverse chain formed of four small bones named on account of their shape the malleus hammer incus anvil lenticular bone or os orbiculare and stapes stirrup the malleus rests upon the membrane of the tympanum and affords attachment to muscles which by contracting may cause it to press more or less strongly upon the membrane in this way it is stretched or relaxed to adapt itself to the intensity of the sounds by which it is struck in the interior of the cavity of the tympanum there are two small openings which are closed up by membranes stretched over them like that of the tympanum they lead to the internal ear one of them called the fenestra ovalis or foramen ovale is in contact with the base of the stapes the other called the fenestra rotunda or foramen rotundum is situated a little lower down the cavity of the tympanum also communicates with a great number of cells which are in the substance of the petrous bone the internal ear is composed of three parts namely the vestibule the semicircular canals and the cochlea figure twenty eight these organs are filled with a watery liquid in which the filaments of the acoustic nerve terminate the vestibule and the acoustic nerves constitute the essential part of the auditory apparatus the other parts which we have just enumerated are destined to perfect this apparatus and for the most part may be destroyed even in man without deafness being the necessary consequence of their loss they are absent in a great many animals for example birds have not the pavilion of the ear reptiles are destitute of the pavilion and the auditory canal in fish all parts of the middle ear or tympanum are wanting and in other animals such as the crawfish the apparatus of hearing consists only of a small vesicle similar to the vestibule End of lesson eight. Lesson nine of The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2018. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 9. Sight. Functions of Relation. Sense of Sight. Light. Apparatus of Vision. Eyebrows. Eyelids. Lacrimal Apparatus. Muscles of the Eye. Structure of the Eye use of different parts of the eye voice of the sight sight is the sense by which we perceive the form color volume and position of objects that surround us this sense which buffon called distant touch is exercised at a distance through the medium of light to comprehend the mechanism of sight it is not sufficient to know the structure of the eye we must also be familiar with some of the properties of light the study of which subject belongs to that branch of science called optics light is a fluid which fills space and illuminates the earth it emanates from luminous bodies such as the sun the fixed stars and substances in combustion and diffuses itself afar with inconceivable rapidity in proportion as the rays become distant from the body from which they emanate they diverge one from the other and for this reason bodies are better lighted the nearer they are to the illuminating body when light meets with a body it either passes through it or is reflected from it or it may be absorbed those bodies which permit light to pass through them are called transparent those which oppose its passage are called opaque 
in order to see an object the rays of light which emanate from it or which are reflected by it must reach to the bottom of the eye for this reason an opaque body placed between the eye and the object at which we look renders the latter invisible the surfaces of opaque bodies do not always reflect back the light the same as they receive it as we have said there are some which absorb all the rays such bodies are called black bodies that reflect all the rays or nearly all are white but those which decompose them are colored color is not inherent in bodies it depends upon the manner in which they decompose the light and the kind of luminous ray that the colored body can reflect each ordinary ray of light though it appears colorless to us is composed of seven differently colored rays there is a very simple mode of being convinced of this fact if we receive a bundle of luminous rays which have passed through a glass prison upon a sheet of paper instead of producing a white image it will form an oblong image in which we distinguish the following seven colors namely red orange yellow green blue indigo violet now objects appear to us white when they reflect the light without decomposing it and colored in this or that manner when they decompose it like the prison and absorb some rays and reflect others in passing through transparent bodies rays of light sometimes continue to follow their primitive direction but on other occasions they change their direction and approach towards or diverge from each other for example when a straight stick is plunged half of its length obliquely into water it seems as if it were broken and it is by acting in this way upon light that the concave or convex glasses of spectacles enlarge or diminish the images of bodies this deviation of light is called refraction in order to see a body the rays of light which part from it must reach the bottom of the eye and there paint an image of the object the impression thus produced is perceived by a particular nerve and by it transmitted to the brain which receives the sensation the apparatus of sight is composed first of the organ of vision which consists of the globe of the eye and its nerve second of the accessory organs of vision that is of the protectors and movers of the eye one the globe of the eye figure thirty one is a hollow ball filled with certain humours and so arranged that the rays of light may penetrate it and collect upon the nerve which occupies its bottom the sides of this globe are composed of a very solid membrane which consists of two parts one situated in front and named transparent cornea the other occupying the sides and bottom and called sclerotica figure thirty one the sclerotica surrounds the eye in all parts except in front it is white and entirely opaque it is this part which is vulgarly called the white of the eye the transparent cornea is on the contrary diaphanous it is framed into a great hole in the sclerotica and resembles a somewhat arched watch glass set into a hollow white ball a short distance behind the transparent cornea is found a sort of vertical partition named iris from its varied colors which are seen through the cornea its center is pierced by an opening which is susceptible of enlargement and diminution it is called the pupil the space comprised between the cornea and the iris is called the anterior chamber of the eye which is filled with a transparent liquid called the aqueous humor behind the pupil we find the crystalline lens which is a transparent lens of a globular form and behind the crystalline we find a diaphantous mass soft as jelly which is called vitreous humor and which fills all the interior of the globe of the eye the optic nerve which comes from the brain enters the globe of the eye through the posterior part of the sclerotica 
and then expands itself out into a soft whitish membrane called retina which envelopes the hinder part of the vitreous humor between the retina and the internal face of the sclerotica we find another membrane generally colored black called the choroid tunica choroides it is this coat which is seen through the retina and the humors of the eye when we look towards the bottom of the organ and which gives to the pupil the appearance of being a black spot inside of a hole such are the different parts which compose the globe of the eye let us pass to the consideration of vision the rays of light which leave an object at which we look penetrate to the retina and there form a small but very clear image of that object the manner in which the light acts in the interior of the eye is the same as in the optical instrument called a camera obscura the different transparent parts through which the luminous rays pass to get from the cornea to the retina have the effect of collecting the rays and concentrating them upon the retina it is the crystalline lens especially that determines this concentration of light and upon this phenomenon depends the formation of images at the bottom of the eye when the eye concentrates the light with too much force we cannot see distinctly except at a very short distance to this infirmity is applied the term myopia or short-sightedness when on the contrary the luminous rays are not sufficiently concentrated in their passage through the eye only distant objects are distinctly seen and this defect is called presbyopia or long-sightedness this feebleness in the refracting power of the eye is a consequence of old age and is remedied by wearing convex glasses before the eyes to give short-sighted people a longer vision we must on the contrary employ spectacles with concave glasses which scatter the luminous rays and thus counterbalance the too strong refracting force of the eye the iris is contractile and its principal use is to regulate the quantity of light which should penetrate to the bottom of the eye when the light is too vivid it contracts and consequently diminishes the pupil through which the rays must pass to reach the retina in the dark on the contrary the pupil is enlarged the choroid membrane which lines the internal face of the globe of the eye is covered with a sort of black varnish which absorbs all the luminous rays not necessary for vision images painted if we may use this term upon the retina are transmitted to the brain through the medium of the optic nerve the accessory parts of the apparatus of vision are of two kinds the one is designated to protect the globe or ball of the eye the other to move it and give the required direction to fulfil its functions in the best manner the protecting organs of the eye are first the orbit second the eyelids third the lacrimal apparatus fourth the eyebrows the orbit is a great bony cavity hollowed out in the face on each side of the nose it has the form of a cone the base of which is open and directed forward its parietes are formed above by the frontal bone below by the superior maxillary bone externally or outwardly by the malar or cheekbone and internally by the bones which belong partly to the nose the bottom of the orbit is pierced by a large hole which communicates with the cranium and gives passage to the optic nerve the ball of the eye is set into this cavity and rests upon a sort of cushion formed of fat it is protected in the same way on all sides except in front and there we find the eyelids the eyelids are movable curtains stretched in front of the ball of the eye on the outside they are formed of the skin internally they are lined by a smooth membrane which is reflected over the front of the eye upon the sclerotica and this membrane is called the membrana conjunctiva between these two membranes the conjunctiva and the skin there is placed a thin plate of fibrous and resisting substance called tarsus or palpebral cartilage as well as muscles which serve to move these organs 
in men there are two eyelids one superior and the other inferior the superior eyelid is larger than the inferior each eyelid has two edges or borders one is continuous with the skin the other is free the free border of the eyelids is bristled with delicate hairs called cilia or eyelashes the use of the cilia is to form a kind of little grating in front of the eye to arrest foreign bodies the presence of which would interfere with the exercise of vision the eyelids perform the double office of protecting the ball of the eye by closing in front of it and of rendering it inaccessible to luminous rays the brilliancy of which might disturb sleep besides the eyelids by their alternate movement of depression and elevation spread over the front of the globe of the eye the tears an aqueous liquid which prevents the cornea from drying and also favors the motion of the eyelids the lacrimal apparatus which secretes the tears is composed of several organs some of which are destined to form this liquid and pour it over the front of the eye and as the presence of the tears if too long continued would become troublesome other organs convey them from the eye the first organs are first the lacrimal gland a small body the size of an almond placed at the exterior and superior part of the globe of the eye between it and the orbitary cavity figure thirty two it serves to secrete the tears second several small canals which arise in this gland and open upon the internal face of the adhering border of the upper eyelid where they constantly pour upon the conjunctiva the lacrimal fluid or tears the organs destined to carry away those tears which have been spread over the front of the eye and to convey them into the nasal fossae or nostrils are two little canals which open upon the free border of the eyelids near the internal angle of the eye by two small orifices called the lacrimal points puncta lacrimalia figure thirty two each of these points which are placed one above and the other below communicate with a little curved canal which runs inwards and opens into a vertical conduit that is larger in size called the nasal canal and which empties into the nasal fossae the function of these lacrimal puncta is to pump up and receive the tears as fast as they are poured over the eye in this way the fluid is carried off as fast as it is formed under particular circumstances the equilibrium between these two phenomena is destroyed and either that the tears are secreted in too large a quantity or the lacrimal puncta do not pump them off with proportioned activity or they are obstructed in the passage through the lacrimal ducts and nasal canal this fluid overruns the eyelids and falls in considerable quantity along the cheeks the eyebrows which form a ridge above the orbit and are garnished with hairs also belong to the protecting organs of the eye but their use is less important than that of those organs of which we have just spoken they assist in shading the eyes when exposed to strong light the motor organs of the eye consist of six muscles which are fixed by their anterior extremities into the sclerotica and by their posterior extremities to the bottom of the orbit figure thirty three by contracting they direct the ocular globe to the side where their muscular fibres are placed the apparatus of vision presents nearly the same structure in the mammalia birds reptiles and fishes but in insects the organization of the eyes is very different as we shall see when we come to the history of these animals through the medium of the senses we take cognizance of all that surrounds us but our relations with the external world would be very imperfect if we could not act upon these bodies exchange place and express what we feel indeed we do possess this power which is the result of the faculty of producing sounds and of the faculty of executing motion of the voice voice consists in the production of a particular sound 
by the aid of the air which escapes from the lungs a great number of organs take part in the performance of this function but that one which is especially its seat is the larynx a sort of cartilaginous tube which at its superior extremity opens into the pharynx by an opening named glottis and which by its inferior opening communicates with the windpipe which is in a manner only a prolongation of it figures thirty four and thirty five the larynx is essentially the organ which produces the voice and it is the passage of air through its interior which occasions the sounds there formed to deprive an animal of this faculty it is only necessary to open the windpipe for then the air finding an exit through the accidental opening no longer passes through the larynx nor is it subjected to the vibrations which would have been imparted by this organ the larynx which is composed of several cartilaginous plates forming in front what is vulgarly called adam's apple is lined by a mucous membrane which forms near its middle two broad lateral folds directed from the front backwards and arranged very much like the edges of a buttonhole these folds are called the vocal cords or inferior ligaments of the glottis by the aid of a little muscle situate in their folds the slit or opening of the glottis which is between them can be narrowed or enlarged under ordinary circumstances the air expelled from the lungs passes freely through the larynx and produces no sound but when the opening of the glottis is narrowed by the contraction of the muscles of this organ and the passage of the air becomes more rapid the voice is heard words are produced by the modifications which the column of air receives in the interior of the mouth by the combined action of the palate the cheeks the tongue and lips End of lesson nine. Lesson ten of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Murphy. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Lesson ten. Motion. The organs of motion are divided into two classes. First, those which act and produce the motive force. Second, those to which the action is communicated, or, in other words, they are divided into the active and passive organs of locomotion. The first are the muscles, the second are the bones or those parts which hold their place. Of the osseous system. Man and all the other mammalia, as well as birds, reptiles, and fishes, have in their structure solid parts which are called bones and the union of these bones, one with the other, constitutes the skeleton. The skeleton is a kind of frame which gives firmness to the body in a considerable degree, determines its dimensions and its form, serves to protect the organs which are most important to life, and furnishes the passive instruments of motion to the function of locomotion. Of the composition of bones. The bones are formed of a species of cartilage, composed of gelatin, the substance which constitutes strong glue. All the laminae, and all the fibers of which are encrusted with a strong matter composed of lime united to particular acids, phosphoric acid, etc. When bone is burned, the stony matter remains alone and is reduced to powder by slight friction, and when bone is steeped in a particular liquid, which has the property of dissolving the stony matter, hydrochloric acid, it is reduced to the state of a flexible cartilage. In infancy, bone is at first cartilaginous, and before ossification is complete, each one is formed of several distinct pieces which run together as it were at a later period the bones that constitute the skeleton are united one to the other by articulations or joints which change their name according to their form if the articulation that unites two bones permits them to move one on the other it is called a movable articulation if on the contrary the articulation is merely to secure the solidity and firmness of the bones it is called immovable the more movable an articulation the less solid it is and vice versa the more solid the less mobility it possesses the immovable articulations take place through the medium of asperities which dovetail together this mode of union is called a suture 
The articular surface of the movable bones is covered with an elastic substance which is capable of bearing the strongest pressure and which deadens the shocks they receive. This substance is called cartilage. The articulations are also supplied with a viscous fluid called synovia, designed to favor the sliding of the articular surfaces upon each other. The extremities of the bones that concur to form an articulation correspond by having their respective configurations reciprocal. They are, in general, one convex, the other concave. The means of union between bones is by fibrous parts which bear the name of ligaments. These are very strong bands or species of cords which surround the articulation or joint, holding together the two bones by their extremities. The articulations present a great variety in the motions of which they are susceptible. The bones are also very different in their forms, and on account of this circumstance, they are divided into long, short, and flat bones. The long bones are generally cylindrical, of considerable size, and in the interior hollowed into a canal filled with a fatty matter called marrow. This form, without injuring their solidity, diminishes their weight. At their extremities, these bones are enlarged to afford a broader surface for the articulation. It is easy to perceive that, if the bones were in contact by small surfaces, their union would have been less solid, they would have afforded only an uncertain and insecure motion, and their derangement would have been as common as it is now rare. About their middle, the long bones are formed almost entirely of very compact substance, but at their swollen extremities, they are chiefly composed of a spongy substance which is not so heavy. It is these bones that form the solid framework of the limbs. Neither the short nor the flat bones have any cavity in the interior. The short bones are formed almost entirely of spongy substance, which lessens their weight without diminishing their volume. The chief use of the flat bones is to form the parietes of cavities which afford protection to internal organs. They are not, however, insusceptible of motion. They furnish points of attachment to many muscles. We remark inequalities upon the surfaces of bones which afford points of attachment for muscles. They often present for the same purpose, as well as for the ligaments of the joints, salient prolongations, which are named apophyses or processes. Of the skeleton. The skeleton is a species of frame formed by the union of the different bones of the body. A great many animals are without it, but it exists in the mammalia, birds, reptiles, and fishes. To study it, we will select the skeleton of man. The skeleton, like the body, is divided into head, trunk, and extremities. The head is placed at the superior extremity of the body and is divided into two parts, the cranium and face. The face presents five great cavities destined to lodge the organs of sight, of smell, and of taste. These cavities are the two orbits for the eyes, the two nasal fossae, and the mouth. A great number of bones concur to form the face. The principal ones are, first, the two superior maxillary bones, which constitute nearly the whole of the upper jaw and rise at the sides of the nose to join the frontal bone. Second, the malar, or cheek bones, which form the cheeks in part and extend from the superior maxillary to the frontal bone so as to complete the orbit on the outside. Third, the inferior maxillary bone, which constitutes the lower jaw, presents nearly the form of a horseshoe. There are also other bones in the face, called palate, nasal, unguiform or lacrimal, spongy bones, and vomer. The cranium is a bony cavity of an oval form, serving to contain the brain. It is formed by the union of several flat bones which are in front the frontal, upon the sides and above the parietal, behind the occipital, below and on the sides the temporal, and in the middle the sphenoid, and inferiorly and in front the ethmoid, which also serves to complete the orbits and form the superior part of the nasal fossae. On the sides of the cranium we remark an opening for the auditory canal, and on its inferior face or base we find many holes which serve to give passage to nerves and blood vessels. One of these holes, very much larger than the others, called the occipital hole, foramen occipitale, corresponds with the vertebral canal and gives passage to the spinal marrow, and on each side of this great hole we find an eminence called condyle, which serves for the articulation of the head upon the vertebral column. The trunk is composed of the vertebral column, the ribs, and sternum. 
The vertebral column, or spine, is a species of bony stalk or stem which occupies the middle line of the back and extends from the head to the posterior extremity of the body. It is formed by the union of small, short bones called vertebrae and presents throughout its whole length a canal formed by the union of the holes by which each vertebra is pierced. This canal serves to lodge the spinal marrow. Each of these bones presents in front of the hole a species of thick, solid disc called the body of the vertebra, which is very firmly united to the body of the vertebra next to it. Behind, we remark prolongations called transverse and spinous processes, which form what is commonly called the spine. The vertebral column is divided into five categories, namely, first, the cervical region, which constitutes the frame of the neck. In man and all the other mammalia, it is composed of seven vertebrae. Second, the dorsal or thoracic region, which gives attachment to the ribs which form the chest or thorax. The vertebrae of this region in man are 12 in number. Third, the lumbar region, which terminates the back below, in man is composed of five vertebrae. Fourth, the sacral region, which articulates with the bones of the hips, is composed in man of five vertebrae, so run or fused together as to form but a single bone called the sacrum. Fifth, the caudal or costigian region, which in man is composed of four very small vertebrae concealed beneath the skin, in many animals is very long, constituting the tail. The vertebral column seen in profile presents four curves which correspond to the neck, the back, the loins, and the pelvis or basin, and which serve to augment its solidity. On its sides we find, between all the vertebrae, a hole which gives passage to a nerve coming from the spinal marrow. The ribs, which are attached to the dorsal vertebrae, are long, flat bones which enclose the thorax on each side. They are curved and bear considerable resemblance to a half hoop. In man, there are twelve pairs. The seven first, called true ribs, articulate in front with the sternum through the medium of a cartilage. The five last pairs, called false ribs, terminate anteriorly by a cartilage which joins that of the preceding rib, or they are entirely without cartilage. The sternum is a flat bone placed in front of the thorax. It articulates with the ribs and with the clavicles. The superior or anterior extremities are composed of the shoulder, the arm, the forearm, and the hand. The shoulder is the basis of the whole limb attached to it. It consists of two bones, the scapula or shoulder blade and the clavicle or collarbone. The scapula is a large bone nearly triangular in shape, which is applied against the ribs at the superior and lateral part of the back. At its superior external angle, it presents an enlarged articular surface, slightly hollowed, which receives the bone of the arm and is called the glenoid cavity of the scapula. On the posterior face of this bone, there is a projecting comb or ridge which extends over the articulation of the shoulder and articulates with the clavicle. This prolongation is named the acromion. The clavicle is a long, thin bone situated at the base of the neck. It extends like a buttress between the scapula and sternum and serves to keep the first of these bones in its natural position and to prevent the shoulder from falling too far forward. The arm is formed of a single bone called the humerus. This bone is of a cylindrical form and has a swelling at its superior extremity called the head of the humerus, which articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Its inferior extremity is enlarged transversely and resembles a pulley upon which moves the forearm. The forearm is formed by the union of two bones which are, on the inner side, the cubitus or ulna, and on the outside, the side on which the thumb is placed, the radius. These bones are joined to the humerus by their superior extremities and to the hand by their inferior extremities. The hand in man is divided into three regions, the carpus, the metacarpus, and fingers. The carpus, or wrist, is composed of eight small bones, ranged in two rows and united to each other by fibrous threads which preserve their mutual relations and permit them to move a little upon each other by aid of the smooth surfaces by which they are in contact. The metacarpus is composed of five bones which may be regarded as the origin of the fingers. They are placed parallel, one alongside of the other. Their superior extremities articulate with the bones of the carpus and their inferior extremities with the fingers. The fingers are composed of small bones articulated one at the extremity of the other and called phalanges. Except the thumb, which has but two, each finger has three of these bones. The inferior extremities are formed nearly in the same manner as the superior. The hip represents the shoulder, the thigh the arm, the leg the forearm, and the foot the hand. 
the hip or haunch serves to support the abdominal member or lower extremity as the shoulder sustains the thoracic member. It is formed on each side by a very large and very strong bone, the ilium. These bones are united together in front, and behind they articulate with the sacrum, so as to form in conjunction with it at the bottom of the belly a sort of bony belt called the pelvis or basin. In infancy we find that the ilium bone consists of three separate portions, one of which resembles the scapula somewhat, and is called the ilium. The second, placed in front, called the pubis, may, perhaps, compare with the clavicle. And the third, situated below and behind, has received the name of ischium, and which supports the whole weight of the body when seated. With age, these three bones become solidified into one. At the point where they unite, we find a very deep circular cavity called the cotyloid, or more commonly the acetabulum, in which is articulated the thigh bone. The pelvis serves not only to support the lower extremities, but also assists in sustaining the weight of the viscera contained in the abdomen and in forming the parietes of this cavity. The thigh is formed of a single bone called the femur. This bone is articulated by its superior extremity with the hip bone and by its inferior extremity with the leg. The leg is formed of two bones very solidly united to each other. The bone placed internally, very much larger than the other, and called tibia, articulates with the femur by its superior extremity. The bone which is placed externally does not quite reach to the femur and is only united to the tibia. It is named fibula. In front of the articulation of the leg with the thigh is placed a small bone named rotula or patella, which is designed to strengthen the knee joint. The foot is divided into three regions, the tarsus, the metatarsus, and toes. It differs from the hand chiefly in the shortness of the fingers, that is, toes, their limited mobility, and by the disposition of the tarsus. The tarsus is constituted of the union of seven bones, one of which alone, called the astragalus, articulates with the two bones of the leg. Another one of these bones, called the calcis, forms a considerable projection which constitutes the heel. The metatarsus is composed of five bones which are united to the tarsus and to the bones of the toes, and which are arranged like the bones of the metacarpus. Like the fingers, the toes are composed of phalanges called first, second, and third phalanges. The great toe has but two phalanges. Each of the others has three. All these little bones are joined to each other by articular surfaces, the contact and junction of which are secured by fibrous ligaments. Of the muscles. All the great motions of the body are caused by the displacement or movement of some of the bones which form the skeleton. But these bones cannot move of themselves and only change their position through the action of other organs attached to them which, by contracting, draw the bones after them. These motor organs are the muscles. They are very numerous and constitute what is commonly called flesh and form nearly one half of the total mass of the body. They are a species of ribbon or fleshy cords composed of fasciculi or bundles of fibers united together and which have the property of contraction or elongation. All the muscles destined to produce the great movements of the body are fixed to the skeleton by their two extremities. It therefore follows that when they contract, they displace those bones which offer the least resistance and draw them towards those which are not movable but serve as points of support for moving the first. Now, in most instances, the bones are more movable in proportion as they are more distant from the center of the body, and the muscles which are fixed between two bones generally act upon that which is most distant, and we always find the muscles, destined to move a bone, extend from it towards the trunk. For example, the muscles which move the fingers occupy the palm of the hand and the forearm, those which flex the forearm upon the arm occupy the arm, and those which move the arm on the shoulder are placed upon the shoulder. Under ordinary circumstances, however, the muscles displace the bones which serve them as points of support. When the body is suspended by the hands and we endeavor to raise it, the flexor muscles of the forearm, not being able to displace the latter, approximate the arm and thus draw the whole body after it. When a muscle contracts, it swells. Its fibers, which in a state of repose were straight, fold and zigzag, and their two extremities are brought near to each other, drawing also with them the parts to which they are attached, but their volume is not augmented. The two extremities of muscle are solidly fixed to the bones and to the other parts which they are designed to set in motion, such as skin, through the medium of white cords called tendons, or membranes of the same nature called aponeuroses or fascia. 
In contracting, they must necessarily draw towards each other the two bones to which the tendons or aponeuroses are attached. An example will enable us better to understand this mechanism. If we suppose the muscle to be attached to the humerus and to the ulna or cubitus, which articulates with the first, forming the elbow joint by movable ligaments, it is evident that when this muscle contracts, these bones will approach each other. This example will give an idea of all the motions of the skeleton. The number of muscles of the human body is very considerable. They are reckoned at 470. In general, they form about the skeleton two layers and are distinguished into superficial and deep-seated. The muscles which are designed to move any particular bone are almost always placed around that portion of the skeleton which is situated between the bone to be moved and the center of the body. For example, the muscles which move the head are situated on the neck, those which move the arm are on the shoulder, those which flex and extend the forearm surround the humerus, and those which flex and extend the fingers are placed upon the forearm. The same is true of the muscles of the lower extremities. The muscles are divided into flexors, extensors, rotators, elevators, etc., according to the uses which they subserve. The contraction of the muscles is determined by the action of the nervous system, and each muscle receives a nerve which is ramified in its substance. This contraction is sometimes affected through the influence of the will, and sometimes independently of it. The muscles whose action is dependent upon the will belong to the functions of relation, and those whose motions are involuntary, the heart, for example, belong to the functions of vegetative life. The strength or power of a muscle depends partly upon its volume and partly on the manner of its attachment to the bone which it moves. All things being in other respects equal, the strongest muscles are the largest, and from exercise both their volume and strength are at the same time increased. In the bodies of animals, the muscles and the bones are generally placed unfavorably for the power of motion, but very favorably for rapidity, as may be easily demonstrated by the elementary principles of mechanism. The muscles not only serve to enable us to execute different motions, but they are also equally necessary to maintain the movable bones in the positions proper to them, and their action determines the attitudes. For example, the head by its own weight has a tendency to fall forward, but the contraction of the muscles on the back of the neck keep it erect. Of the attitudes. The term attitude is applied to any position of the body that is permanent during any considerable time. In order to explain the mechanism of the attitudes, it will be necessary to enter into some of the details which properly belong to the study of physics. All bodies, when left to themselves, tend towards each other from the influence of a general force called attraction, and the force with which one body attracts another is great in proportion as its mass is larger comparatively than that of the attracted body. Now, the mass of the earth being incomparably larger than that of the animals, plants, stones, and all other objects spread upon its surface, attracts them unceasingly and tends to cause them to fall towards the center of the globe. In order that a body shall rest in the position it occupies, it must be sustained by something capable of resisting this force of attraction and which does not give way under its weight, such as the solid surface of the earth itself or an inflexible body placed between it and this surface. We name base of support the space occupied by the points by which an object supports itself upon a resistant body or the space comprised between these points. In order that a solid body shall rest motionless or immovable upon its base of support and not fall, it is not necessary that all its points should be thus sustained. It is enough to sustain it by a single point, provided this point be placed in such a manner that if a part of the mass fall towards the earth, another part opposite to it, and of equal weight, be elevated as much, the weight of one part counterbalancing the other. Center of gravity is the name given to the point about which all points of a body reciprocally balance each other, and if it be sustained, it is sufficient to maintain the entire mass in place. It follows, then, that to prevent a body from falling, it is sufficient that its base be placed vertically beneath its center of gravity. It is also easy to understand that its equilibrium will be more stable in proportion to the extent of its base, or then its center of gravity may be more displaced without the vertical line which passes through the center of gravity being carried beyond the limits of this base of support. The more the center of gravity is elevated above the base of support, the less firm, on the contrary, will be the equilibrium, for a smaller displacement from this point will then suffice to carry the vertical line that descends from it beyond the base of support, which soon causes the body to fall. The term attitude is applied to any position of the body that is permanent during any considerable time.
the principal attitudes of man are lying sitting and the erect position on his feet or standing when a man is lying on his back or on his belly all parts of the body rest upon the earth he is not then required to contract any muscle to keep them in place and his position unites in the highest degree the two conditions of equilibrium to wit the greatest possible extent of the base of support and the proximity of the centre of gravity to this base hence the attitude of repose is that from which it is most difficult to fall in the sitting position the body rests upon the tuberosities of the ischium or haunch bones the base of support is considerable since it is represented by the pelvis the extent of which is increased by the soft parts which cover it this position also next to lying offers the greatest solidity but it cannot be preserved without muscular action when the back is supported the muscles of the neck alone contract to preserve the head erect but if the back is not supported as when seated on a stool or a bench for example then the greater part of muscles on the back of the trunk contract to prevent it from falling forward and fatigue will sooner or later result from this permanent action when man is erect the lower extremities sustain the body and transmit to the earth the weight which they support consequently these limbs must not bend under the load and must be kept straight by the contraction of their extensor muscles in this position the centre of gravity of the whole body lies in the cavity of the pelvis and the base of support is circumscribed by the space comprised between the two feet here a slight force is sufficient to destroy the equilibrium and it is only by enlarging the base of support in one direction more than in the other that a fall can be prevented the movements by which we regain the perpendicular in the base of support are in a measure automatic thus to resist a force tending to make us fall forward the foot is rapidly advanced if the body leans to the left we suddenly extend the right arm to re-establish the equilibrium if a force tends to throw us backward we put a foot behind and throw the body in advance the man who has a large belly and the man bearing a heavy load upon his shoulders are both obliged to assume attitudes that change the position of the centre of gravity the first carries the body backwards in order that the vertical line passing through this point may also fall between the two feet and for the same reason the second bends the body forward a woman who carries an infant upon her right arm inclines the body to the left side thus we are constantly resorting to mechanics even without possessing the most elementary notions of the science and the most certain causes of our preservation are found in the continual application of physical laws of which our reason has not the knowledge when an animal rests upon its four members at the same time his standing is more firm more solid and less fatiguing for the base of support is then very large then without inconvenience the feet may be much smaller than in the bipeds and consequently lighter of locomotion the objects of the motions which we perform is either to change the position of certain parts of the body or to transport us from one place to another the faculty of changing place is called locomotion the movements of progression by the help of which man and animals change place are produced by certain parts of the body which being flexed rest upon a resisting object and being again immediately extended push forward the rest of the body in man the organs of locomotion are the abdominal members or lower extremities in quadrupeds the thoracic as well as the abdominal members and in birds that fly the wings in walking the body of man is moved alternately by one of the feet and sustained by the other without his ever ceasing completely to rest on the ground this last circumstance distinguishes walking from leaping and running movements in which the body quits the earth for a moment and launches into the air in walking one of the feet is carried forward while the other is extended on the leg and as this last member is supported on the ground its elongation displaces the pelvis and throws the whole body forward when the foot which was advanced it lights upon the ground the pelvis turns on the femur of that side and the leg which was at rest behind is flexed and carried front of the other touches the earth and in its turn serves to sustain the body while the other limb by being extended gives a new impulse to the pelvis by the aid of these alternate movements of flexion and extension each limb in turn bears the weight of the body as it would do when standing on one foot and at each step the centre of gravity of the whole mass of the body is pushed forward security in walking is always in a direct ratio to the degree of separation of the feet and in an inverse ratio to the mobility of the surface that supports us it is only at the end of a certain time that sailors walk securely upon the deck when they have once got their sea legs it is very easy to recognize them on the shore from the habit which they have of considerably separating the feet in walking leaping or jumping is a movement by which a man projects himself into the air 
and again falls to the ground as soon as the effect of the impulsion is lost the mechanism of the leap consists entirely in the previous flexion of the joints and their sudden extension when a jumper wishes to spring he shortens himself by folding himself up as it were upon himself the leg is flexed forward on the foot the thigh is also flexed back on the knee and the trunk with the pelvis are flexed forward on the thigh and when one wishes to spring with all his strength the trunk is flexed upon itself like a spring all these preliminaries of the leap the lower extremities and the body describe a series of zigzags at the moment of the leap all the articulations are extended at the same instant and raise the body with such rapidity that it leaps into the air like an elastic rod that had been bent to the ground and then suddenly abandoned to its elasticity or spring it is easy to perceive that the parts which act most in the leap are the legs indeed it is upon them that the weight to be raised is most considerable the facility and rapidity of the leap are always in direct ratio to the energy of the muscles which determine the extension of the legs it is observed that the most vigorous dancers and even great walkers have the calf strongly developed indeed this part is formed of the muscles which affect the extension of the leg upon the foot running partakes both of walking and leaping there is always a moment in running when the body is suspended in the air a circumstance which distinguishes it from rapid walking in which the foot that rests behind does not leave the ground until the forward one again touches it swimming and flying are movements analogous to those of leaping but which take place in water or in the air fluids whose resistance to a certain extent take the place of that of the ground in the act of leaping when an animal is destined to live in water and to swim its members have a different form from that of those animals which are organized for walking only the limbs are then short and constitute a species of paddles or oars called fins when the animal is designed to elevate himself in the atmosphere the thoracic members on the contrary are very much expanded and are so arranged on each side of the body as to form a kind of movable sail or fan fit to strike the air with force in one of the following lessons when we consider the mammalia and birds we shall recur to the study of these organs and we shall see how the same members may constitute in different animals the instruments of prehension of walking of natation or of flight we here conclude what we propose to say generally on the manner in which the principal phenomena of animal life are performed and on the organs which serve as instruments for the exercise of the faculties with which animals are endowed we shall next proceed to study each of these animals in particular and see in what way they differ from each other end of lesson ten recording by ellen murphy glossary of the elements of anatomy and physiology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rauschenberger. Glossary A through C. Abdomen. From the Latin abdere, to conceal. The belly. The chief viscera contained in the abdomen are the stomach, intestines, liver, etc. Absorption. From the Latin absorbere. To suck up the function of absorbent vessels by virtue of which they take up substances from without or within the body acetabulum from the latin acetum vinegar from its resemblance to the ancient greek vinegar vessel called oxybaphon see cotyloid acoustic from the greek akuo i listen relating to sounds acromion from the Greek akros, extreme, and amos, the shoulder, the superior prominence of the scapula that joins to the clavicle, forming the bony point of the shoulder. Adult, one arrived at maturity, full grown. Aliment, from the Latin alimentum, which is formed from alere to nourish. Any substance which, if introduced into the system, is capable of nourishing it and repairing its losses. Food. Alveolus, Latin, the hole in which a tooth is placed. Alveoli, plural of alveolus, sockets of the teeth. Anatomy, from the Greek ana, through, and timno, I cut, the description of the structure of animals. 
the word anatomy properly signifies dissection but it has been appropriated to the study and knowledge of the number shape situation structure and connection in a word of all the apparent properties of organized matter whether animal or vegetable anatomical relating or belonging to anatomy analogous from the greek ana between and logos reason having some resemblance or relation though differing in essential particulars similar analysis from the greek analuo i dissolve the separation of bodies into their component parts anfractuosity from the latin anfractus the bending or winding of a way in or out a groove or furrow based in anatomy to signify sinuous depressions of greater or less depth like those that separate the convolutions of the brain animal from the latin animalis a name given to every animated being provided with digestive organs animalcule from the latin animalacula a diminutive animal animacula plural of animaculum animals that are only perceptible by means of the microscope analytes a class of animals without vertebrae anus latin the fundament the inferior opening of the bowels aorta from the greek aorte a vessel the great artery which arises from the left ventricle of the heart and conveys the blood to all parts of the body aortic relating to the aorta apineuroses from the greek apo from a neuron a nerve the ancients called every white part neuron membranous expansions of muscles and the tendons are so called apophysis from the greek apo from and phuo i rise an eminence or process of bones apparatus latin ad for ampare to prepare a collection of instruments or organs for any operation whatever an assemblage of organs appendix latin ad to and pendere to hang something added any part that adheres to an organ or is continuous with it arachnides from the greek arachne a spider insects of the genus of spiders arachnoid from the greek arachne a spider's web and eidos resemblance a thin transparent membrane which covers the brain artery from the greek arteria formed according to some from air air and terrine to preserve because it was anciently believed that the arteries were filled with air like the windpipe the vessels which convey blood from the heart to all parts of the body are called arteries arterial belonging or relating to an artery articulate from the latin articulus which is the diminutive of artis a limb which is derived from the greek earthron a joint to join or joint to form words to utter articulation a joint asphyxia from the greek a privative and sphyxis pulse suspended animation asphyxiate in a state of suspended animation astragalus name of the bone of the foot which articulates with the tibia in the ankle joint astronomy from the greek astron a star a nomos law the natural history of the heavenly bodies atmosphere from the greek atmos vapor and sphira a sphere or globe the air which surrounds the earth auditorius latin belonging or relating to the sense of hearing oracle from the latin auricula which is the diminutive of aris an ear the two oracles of the heart derive the name from their resemblance to ears 
auricular ventricular relating or belonging both to an auricle and a ventricle automatic from the greek automatus self-moved spontaneous which is formed from autos himself amao i desire automatic movements are those which depend on the structure of the body and are independent of the will such as that of respiration the circulation of the blood etc axillary from the latin axilla the armpit belonging or relating to the armpit azote from the greek a privative and zoe life without life because azote will neither support animal life nor combustion a gas which is unfit for respiration it is one of the component parts of the atmosphere it is also called nitrogen bile a yellow greenish viscid bitter nauseous fluid secreted by the liver to aid in the process of digestion the gall bolus latin a mass lump or mouthful a ball botany from the greek botane a plant the natural history of plants brachial from the latin brachium an arm belonging or relating to the arm brankly latin it is derived from the greek branchos the throat the gills of fishes they are the respiratory organs of fishes and are very different from lungs both in their form and structure bronchle from the greek bronchos the throat the two branches of the windpipe which convey air to the lungs calcus latin genitive of calx the heel chimera latin a chamber canine from the latin canis a dog the name of certain teeth capillary from the latin capillus hair hair like small the capillary vessels are the extremely minute terminations of the arteries and commencing branches of the veins capsules dental membranous pouches in which the teeth are formed cardia from the greek cardia the heart the left opening of the stomach where the esophagus enters it carotid the great arteries of the neck which convey blood to the head are so called carpus from the greek kapos the wrist the part between the forearm and hand cartilage gristle a solid part of the animal body of medium consistence between bone and ligament caudal from the latin cauda a tail belonging or relating to the tail cava latin hollow vena cava the hollow or deep-seated vein a name given to the two great veins of the body which meet at the right oracle of the heart cerebellum the diminutive of cerebrum the little brain the inferior portion of the brain contained in the cranium cerebrospinal belonging or relating to both the cerebrum and spine cerebrum the brain the term is sometimes applied to the whole contents of the cranium at others to the upper portion the posterior and inferior being called cerebellum cervical from the latin cervix the neck belonging or relating to the neck choroid from the greek chorion the skin and idus resemblance the name of several vascular membranes a thin membrane of a very dark color which lines the sclerotica internally corodes choroid chyle from the greek kulos nutritious juice a nutritive fluid of a whitish appearance which is extracted from food by the action of the digestive organs chyle latin of chyle chylification from the latin chylus chylic and facere to make the formation of chyle by the digestive processes chyme from the greek kumos juice a kind of grayish pulp formed from the food 
after it has been for some time in the stomach. Chymification, from the Greek kumus, juice, and the Latin facere, to make. The formation of chyme. Cilia, Latin, the eyelashes. Clavicle, from the Latin clavus, a key, the collarbone. Coccygeum, relating to the coccyx, which is an assemblage of small bones appended to the sacrum. If prolonged, it would constitute a tail. Cochlea, Latin, a snail shell the name of one of the three cavities which form the labyrinth of the ear. Celiac, the name of one of the arteries of the abdomen. Concha, the hollow part of the cartilage of the external ear. Condyle, from the Greek condulus, a knot, an eminence, a bump, a small round eminence of bone entering into the composition of an articulation. Conjunctiva, Latin, formed from con, with, and jungere, to join. The mucous membrane which covers the anterior surface of the ball of the eye and unites it to the lids. Corium, the skin. Cornea, one of the coats of the eye, so called because it has some resemblance to horn. It forms about one-fifth of the anterior part of the eye. Cotyloid, from the Greek katule, a drinking cup, an idus, resemblance. The name of a hemispherical cavity in a bone of the pelvis, which receives the head of the thigh bone, forming the hip joint. It is also called the acetabulum. Cranium, from the Greek cranon, head. The skull. Crustacea, from the Latin crusta, a crust. A class of animals whose bodies are enclosed in a covering like the crab. Cubital, relating to the cubitus. Cubitus, Latin, one of the bones of the forearm, which is also called ulna. End of glossary A through C. Glossary of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rauschenberger. Glossary D through M. Deciduous. From the Latin cadere, to fall. Falling, that which falls off, not permanent. Deglutition. From the Latin deglutire. To swallow, the act by which substances are passed from the mouth into the stomach through the pharynx and esophagus. Derma, Greek, the skin. Diaphanous, from the Greek dia, through, and phanein, to shine, permitting the passage of light. Diaphragm, from the Greek diaphragma, a partition, the fleshy or muscular partition between the cavity of the chest and cavity of the abdomen. Diastole, from the Greek diastelo, I open, I dilate. The dilation of the heart and arteries when the blood enters their cavities. Dorsal, from the Latin dorsum, the back, belonging or relating to the back. Dura, Latin, hard. Dura mater is a dense membrane which covers the brain lying between it and the skull. Encephalon, from the Greek egg, in, and cephale, head, the brain and spinal marrow. Epidermis, from the Greek epi, upon, and derma, skin, the external covering of the derma, the cuticle or scarf skin. Epiglottis, from the Greek epi, upon, and glottis, the glottis, a species of cartilaginous valve situate at the upper part of the larynx behind the base of the tongue. It closes at the moment of swallowing and thus assists in preventing the passage of alimentary substances into the air tubes. Ethmoid, from the Greek ethmos, a sieve, and idus, resemblance. 
the ethmoid bone so called because its upper plate is pierced by a considerable number of holes is situate at the base of the cranium betwixt the orbits excretion from the latin excernere to separate the separation or throwing off of those matters from the body of an animal which are supposed to be useless as perspiration etc the matters thrown off from the body as useless are termed excretions excretory an excretory vessel or duct is one which transmits the fluid secreted by a gland either externally or into the reservoirs in which it has to be deposited excretory organ means any organ charged with the office of excreting thus the skin is said to be an excretory organ because through it the perspiration or sweat is excreted exhalation from the latin exhalare to throw out to exhale that which exhales from our any body a function by the virtue of which certain fluids obtained from the blood are spread in the form of dew on the surface of membranes either for the sake of being thrown out of the body or to serve for certain purposes the sweat is also an example of exhalation as well as of an excretion extend to straighten to stretch out when a limb is straightened it is said to be extended extensor a muscle whose office it is to extend certain parts external outside it is used in relation to the middle line of the body for example the little toe is external and the big toe internal the corner of the eye next to the nose is the internal corner and the other the external corner of the eye externus latin external extremities the limbs the legs and arms fascia latin formed from fasces a bundle the aponeurotic expansions of muscles which bind parts together are so termed fasci plural of fascia fosses latin the swallow or gorge foctum latin the genitive case plural of fo see isthmus focum latin femoral relating to the femur femur latin the thigh bone fenestra latin a window an opening or hole fiber an organic filament of a solid consistence and more or less extensible which enters into the composition of every animal and vegetable texture fibril fibrilla a very small fiber fibrous composed of fibers belonging or relating to fiber fibular latin a clasp a brace the name of the long small bone situate at the outer part of the leg it assists materially in holding the foot in its proper position filament from the latin filamentum which is the diminutive of filum a thread a very small fiber a fibril fissure from the latin fissura which is formed from fendere to cleave a long narrow cleft or opening flex to bend flexion the state of being bent flexor a muscle whose opposite is to bend certain parts follicle from the latin follis a bag a diminutive glandular sac or bag foramen latin a hole foramina latin plural of foramen holes fossa latin from fadio i dig a cavity of greater or less depth the entrance to which is always larger than the base the nasal fossae are two large irregular cavities situate between the orbits below the cranium and behind the nose the nostrils function from the latin fungor i act i perform the action of an organ or set of organs we see for example by the function of the eye and the function or action of the ear enables us to hear ganglion from the greek ganglion a knot nervous ganglions are enlargements or knots in the course of a nerve ganglionic consisting of ganglions 
relating to ganglions. Gas. Any substance or fluid which is permanently aeriform under the ordinary conditions of the atmosphere. Gastric. From the Greek gastet, the stomach. Belonging or relating to the stomach. Genus. Latin. A kindred breed, race, stock, lineage, or family. Genera. Plural of genus. Generic. Belonging or relating to genus. Geology. From the Greek geo, the earth, and logos, a discourse. A description of the structure of the earth. Glenoid. From the Greek glenae, the pupil, and idus, resemblance. Any shallow articular cavity which receives the head of a bone. Globule. From the Latin globulus a small globe. Glottis, a small oblong aperture situate at the upper part of the larynx. Hemisphere, from the Greek emesis, half, and sphira, sphere or globe. One half of a sphere or globe, or globular body. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. Humerus, the bone of the arm which is situate between the shoulder joint and the elbow. Iliac, from the Latin ilia, the flank, relating or belonging to the flank or ilium. Ilium, the haunch bone. Incisor, from the Latin incido, I cut. The teeth which occupy the anterior part of the upper and lower jaws are called incisors or incisor teeth because they are used for cutting the food in the manner of cutting in tremulous. Instruments. Insect, from the Latin insectum, which is formed from secari to cut, the generic name of small animals whose body is, as it were, divided or cut into several parts, as the chest and belly. Insects have neither a circulating apparatus nor vertebrae, but they possess an apparatus for breathing, have jointed extremities, and generally have wings. Intercostal, from the Latin inter, between, and costa a rib, that which is situate between the ribs. Internal, see external. Intussusception, from the Latin intus, within, and suscipio, I receive, the mode of increase peculiar to organized bodies. Ischiatic, from the Greek ischion, the haunch, an epithet applied to parts connected with the haunch. Ischium, the hip bone, the seat bone. Isthmus, Latin, formed from the Greek isthmus, a narrow tongue of land joining a peninsula to a continent. Anatomists have given the name isthmus phocium, isthmus of the phocis, to the strait or passage between the mouth and the pharynx. Juxtaposition, from the Latin juxta, near to, and ponere, to place. The mode of increase proper to minerals, which is by the successive addition of new matter on the outside of that which already existed. It is the office of intussusception. Labyrinth, from the Latin labyrinthus, which is formed from the Greek labyrinthos, a place full of turnings, the exit of which is not easily discoverable. Anatomists have given this name to the aggregate of parts constituting the internal ear. Lacrimal, from the Latin lacrima, a tear, relating to the tears. Lacrimalia, Latin, belonging or relating to the tears. Lamina, Latin, a plate or thin piece of metal or bone. Lamini, Latin, plural of lamina. Larynx, from the Greek larynx, a whistle, the apparatus of voice. It is situate at the superior and anterior part of the neck and at the top of the trachea, with which it communicates. Levator, a muscle whose office it is to raise or elevate certain parts. Ligament, from the Latin ligare, to tie, a name given to fibrous structures which serve to unite bones and form articulations. Lobe, a round projecting part of an organ. Lumbar, relating to the loins. Lymph, a name given to the fluid contained in the lymphatic vessels 
and thoracic duct of animals. Lymphatic, partaking of the nature of lymph, relating or belonging to lymph. Malar, bone, from the Latin malum, an apple, so called from its roundness, the cheekbone. Malleus, Latin, a hammer. Mammalia, from mama, a breast, animals that suckle their young. Mammology, from the Latin mamma, breast, and the Greek logos, a discourse or treatise, that part of natural history which treats of mammiferous animals. Mammary, from the Latin mamma, a breast, belonging or relating to the breast. Mammifere, mammifers, from the Latin mamma, a breast, and ferro, I carry, animals that have teeth. Mammiferous, belonging or relating to mammiferi. Mater, Latin, mother. Meatus, Latin, a passage. Medulla, Latin, marrow. Membrana, Latin, a membrane. Membrane, a name given to different thin organs representing species of supple, more or less elastic webs. Membranous, or membraneous belonging to membrane. Mesentery, from the Greek mesos, in the middle, and enteron, and intestine, a term applied to several duplicatures of the peritoneum, which maintain the different portions of the intestinal canal in their respective situations, allowing, however, more or less mobility. Mesenteric, relating to the mesentery. Metacarpus, from the Greek meta, after, and carpus, the wrist, that part of the hand which is between the wrist and fingers. Metatarsus, from the Greek meta, after, and tarsus, the instep, that part of the foot which is between the instep and toes. Meteorology, from the Greek meteoros, a meteor, and logos, a discourse, the natural history of the atmosphere. Mineralogy, from the Latin minera, a mineral or mine, and the Greek logos, a discourse, the natural history of minerals. Mitro, of the form of a mitre or a bishop's bonnet, the name of two valves of the heart. Molar, from the Greek mulos, a millstone or grindstone, or from the Latin molo, I grind, that which bruises or grinds, the name of certain teeth. Molar teeth, the grinders, jaw teeth. Mollusca, from the Latin mollus, soft, a class of marine animals without vertebrae, which have blood vessels, a spinal marrow, and simple body without articulated limbs. Molluscus, relating to mollusca. Motor, motive, that which moves or gives the power to move. Myopia, from the Greek mus, a mouse, and ops, sight because mice were supposed to be short-sighted, nearsightedness. End of glossary, D through M.